Hello, everybody. Here we are again. So excited. Happy to be here. I want to try to get this out as one last video. Okay, so we can get this done. I'm going to be posting part two today. This is part three. Um, I want to go ahead and give my shout outs now. And so I want to shout out to Raised by Giants. I'm using his interviews with Jerry Marzinski. Shout out to Jerry Marzinski. The channels that they both have are great, great channels. Um, also, I finally got your name right too, by the way. <laughs> this is for educational purposes only. Um, we deal with a lot of psychosis. I personally deal with it in my life. Uh, to recap, my child, as you all know that are following me, um, she has psychosis. It started out as the diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia and through drug use, psychosis has come out and she has several personalities or things or whatever she talks to. Um, as I guess this is my way of processing it and learning about it because I have an open mind about it and I'm not committed to believing it's just a disease that just happens. I think it's more than what we're willing to give it credit for. I think it's more spiritual. Um, and so that's why I'm going through this with you guys. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in it. I don't want to waste any more time. There's a lot of nuggets in this video. And then I want to show, we might do the one more video if I have to with his nurse. That would be the last one if I have to do one more because his friend, the nurse, um, I don't want to botch her name up. So I'll say it later. I think it's Lynn, but she has a heartwarming story. <laughs> about how her mother passed and how she witnessed that and the um, emotions of love and stuff come into it. In fact, that is definitely going to be the last one I show because that's going to be my segue into Derek and mine's <laughs> communication because when that happened, that's when I started seeing um plasma while well, I was aware of what it was I see it in the sky I see it around me and usually I have communication when that happens and I'm not on drugs so well, I'm smoking dispensary weed but and don't get me wrong I'm sure some of that stuff is potent enough to maybe I don't know I've never had anything potent enough to make me trip but not not weed I'm not a newbie. So anyways, we're getting way off track. I want to get on this. He has a lot of good things that he talks about. Like, I want to do some bullet points real quick. Because we're going to hear about how the medications shrink your brain. We're going to hear about how it is not a disease. It's not genetic. It's not something they find in their blood. It's not something they find in their brain. It's just not. We're going to talk about where your voices really come from. We're also going to hear about how drugs are a gateway to opening the doors to this. And hopefully we'll get to his assistant or the co-writer. I don't know, but she's a friend for sure of Jerry's. And she has been a nurse in the psych ward for years and has experience with this plus she has third eyesight so all right let's go all right i am gonna skip through some stuff but let's see where we are right now the entire history of psychiatry 
Um, with yeah, it's pretty per, pretty ugly and still going on to this day. Very still... ugly. The, the history of trying to cure and rid patients of paranoid schizophrenia, which is very yeah. alarming, such a such as drilling a hole into the patient's skull and pouring distilled alcohol into it. How crazy. Spinning machines, long-term standing, hydrotherapy, electroshock. Wow. Right? Transorbitable uh, lobotomies. You know, basically a bunch of torture devices that really did absolutely yeah. no good. It seemed like uh, their answer back then was just to turn the patients into zombies, which I think is exactly what they're trying to do today, but just but, in a different right. way, right? They, they, that's exactly right. They, they... I believe that too. And if they can get them mentally zombified, then they're not going to procreate. Plus, I'm sure the medications cause sterilization anyways. A lot of them do. And then, um, of course, they're working on, you know, making sure in other ways that you're sterile. <clears throat> Just saying. Drugs they're using today don't have the nasty side effects of all the ones that, you know, they're still, they're still dangerous. They're still some of the most dangerous drugs used in medicine today. These antipsychotic drugs, they, with long-term use, they rot out the brain, you know, they rot out the peripheral nervous system. And they found that when they started doing autopsies for, with um, uh, patients from state hospitals, you know, they saw their brains were shrunk up like walnuts. And the, the, the researchers go, Hey, look at, this is what we're finding. Uh, we think it's due to the psychiatric drugs. Wow. And they never stopped. It never occurred to them that they are doing it. And they never stopped. Never stopped. And they never occurred Never occurred that this could be happening. You know. And, of course, the psychiatric mafia and big pharma go, oh, no, 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 it's, it's, it's not us. It's not us. It's, it's schizophrenia is doing that. No. Uh, so they went back and they started feeding those same antipsychotic drugs to monkeys and rats and mice and their brain shrunk also so these drugs that they're using today they don't tell the patients this i've never heard a psychiatrist tell the patient how dangerous these drugs are they say and i have to say i took a medication a couple of years ago to help with memory right and i kept getting sick uh, i couldn't take it well, finally, I pulled the leaflet out of the package after about two months of trying, rearranging medication, still every day sick, bad headache. I read on there that if I got any of the contents of that capsule on my skin, that it could eat my skin, and I, will, I immediately threw it away. And then my nurse was like, oh, you shouldn't have done that. You should have weaned yourself off of it because it's a psychiatric medicine and it causes a different kind of withdrawal, but you see tracers and just, yeah. I learned then and decided I'm never messing with anything like that again, ever. If I'm depressed, I'll take care of it myself by pointing out what caused my depression because if you stay straight, you usually know what affects you. you. Usually know as soon as it does what it is. And I know what I did. Sorry, back to the video. Well, you're gonna get you're you're gonna have blurry vision, you're gonna feel sedated, you're you know, you may have some sexual dysfunction, uh, you might get nervous at times. They don't tell them all the bad, awful side effects, the dangerous side effects of these things. You know, they're they're just not mentioned. Well, not but only we, that, they, they change it up and they switch up the concoction. Like when you when a patient comes back to the a psychiatrist and was like, oh, that didn't work out for me, then they just switch it to something that's very similar, but just with a different name. Yes. Yeah, it's just they go round and round and round. They just keep giving different drugs until they find one that they think works. Have you ever heard that? Uh, Selexa is the mirror image drug of... Wow, I can't remember what the, but it's an old anti-psychotic psychotic drug, and apparently they pulled it, so the company made a mirror image drug that was good for you, 
that was good for you. How do they get away with doing this? Like I just said, by making a mirror image drug of it. Just change up a few chemicals and then bam, it works. It's the best. You know, there there is no test. You know, the, there there is no test for any of these mental illnesses. None. There's no lab work. There's no EKG. There's no EEG. There's no uh, solid concrete test for any of these mental illnesses. They're all made up, just like that Eli Lilly lie was. They took segments of human behavior and they pathologized them. They put a label on them. And then now they can use them for insurance. You know, oh, this guy's got uh, uh, mathematics syndrome or whatever they put it down at. And they have to have a diagnosis for the insurance to pay. Yeah. As soon as they put a diagnosis on it, then bam, there's money. So you walk in with a dollar sign on your head. You're just a walking diagnosis. Hmm. He looks schizophrenic. Bam. $1,700. I don't know how much it is. I'm just... You, you get what I'm saying. But you know, I got off the off the topic a little bit. You were asking about the patterns. Okay, there's like 23 of them now, and I, I can run through them pretty quick. Yeah. Now, what what these are is like um, if you had a magnet, a big magnet, you can't see that magnetic field. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. You can't feel it. You can't sense it with any of your senses. For all practical purposes, it doesn't exist, as far as your senses are concerned. You get a bottle of ground up uh, iron filings and you, you put that on the magnetic field. Now you can see it. Okay, That's what these patterns are. These are the operational definition of schizophrenia. These are the iron filings because schizophrenia is an energetic uh, malady. It's not a physical malady. It's not caused by anything physical. It's caused by these energetic... Boom. Oh. I agree. It's an energetic disease. So that's big. Think about that. How many other diseases could be created by tweaking the atmospheric vibration, frequency? Or the, I want to say it another way, by changing the frequency of the atmosphere, of the earth. Tweaking it. Changing it. Spiking it. Schumann resonance spikes a lot. Could that cause different things to happen to us? I would think if we're used to it being 7.2, 7.2, 7 7.3, I would think anything above that you know, especially if it spikes like 12 points or something, like that would probably affect stuff. Could it even cause an illness like, I don't know, a flu or something maybe? I don't know. I don't know. We don't know, guys. We're just guessing. Entities that psychiatry doesn't believe in. They don't want to believe in. They don't want a cure because their their entire. This is true. You're not going to sell any pills if you admit it's an entity. If you admit, admit that your patient is being attacked by the devil, in a sense, you ain't going to sell any medicine that way, huh? Big Pharma would be straight out of business on that. Unless they come up with the home kit exorcism. There you go, folks. We need to try. <laughs> Operation, their entire job depends on there not being a cure. So people could come back and keep getting these medicines you know, over and over and over again. Pay, what, $150, $200 for an uh, office visit. And then they're paying, uh, what, $800, $900 a month for these antipsychotic drugs, you know. You go across the border here, 60 miles south of here, you go into Mexico, you can get those same drugs in a Mexican pharmacy made by the same pharmaceutical industry 
for $75 for a month's supply versus $800 here in the U.S. because the pharmaceutical industry has control of the Congress and they passed laws that you can't go over there and get these things. They don't want you bringing drugs back across the border. Mm-hmm. And we're so, the one of the only countries in the world that is able to um, sell uh, pharmaceutical commercials on TV. Yeah, that should be illegal. Yep. You know, it should be. So, I mean, it's a racket. It's a friggin' racket. And, and they wonder why the American health care cost is so astronomical with them doing that. Have it's you noticed big... that? Have you noticed that, Jerry? Like, have you watched TV recently and, and watched some of the commercials? It's always negativity. It's always some yeah. kind of disease. It's diabetes. Right. It's cancer. So it's almost like they're they're wishing that upon. Okay, I think I'm gonna skip through some of this. On wanna, the viewer, I don't want to take his interview. Writer again, thank you. You do your work. You do good. This is educational purposes only, guys. Paranoid schizophrenia, or yes. what they label as paranoid schizophrenia. Yeah, and, and it surprised me. I mean, it really surprised me because working in the state hospital, I didn't work with children. Working in the state prison, I didn't work with children. When I got out, the last 10 years, I spent doing psych crisis in hospital emergency rooms and all the big hospitals around town. That's where I started seeing the children. Wow. And yeah, they were they were young and they were hearing voices. Yeah. Because that's the real question right there, and it really answers everything you need to know. If a child can develop paranoid schizophrenia, then that means we're dealing with something else other than trauma, which is not out of the realm of possibility that a child can also be uh, traumatized as well. But right, and that brings into a whole other realm of questioning as well. Uh, because it could be a child's escape from trauma, having an invisible friend. I can see that. And it turning into more once you're taking it based off that trauma. Because I believe the trauma is a predecessor to it a is. lot of mental disorders. And if yes. you couple that with illicit drug use, like amphetamine yep. or methamphetamine, which I also believe is a uh, contribution into the factor. Uh, and, you know, during during my yep. study into uh, the CIA's MK Ultra programs, I discovered that antidepressants, yep. antipsychotics, amphetamine, which yep. is Adderall and Ritalin, yep. were all tested on the patients within the CIA's MK Ultra programs, which started in the early 50s until 85 when it was shut down. Yep. Before these medications were given to the public, which then led me to a study that was done in 2014 to 2006. And I'll stop right there for a second. I gotta do something. Whew. Sorry about that, guys. I got a little lightheaded. I can take care of something. Okay, now let's get back to it. The good stuff. The <laughs> sixteen that showed that more than half the percent of the population, the U.S. population, right, was on some form of pharmaceutical drug. That's which, awful. Just uh, more than half of the U.S. population is on some sort of pharmaceutical drug. Well, that's just pharmaceutical drugs. Like that's not accounting illicit drug use, right? And that number is super alarming. It is. Just it 2014 is. to 2016. No doubt that that number has jumped up by leaps and bounds since then. But when I looked up illicit drug use and how many people that have that use illicit drugs also suffer from mental disorders and the staggering amount of 64 percent of illicit drug users have mental illness. Yes. Yes. And that is when my daughter's symptoms became uncontrollable without medication was that street drug. That's amphetamines. Yeah, the amphetamine is one of the ones that I've seen more prisoners go psychotic on amphetamine than any other drug. You know, and they start using it and they start hearing voices and they go, oh, that's just a hallucination. It's, it's awful, but it'll go away. And it does. You know, then they use it again, it happens again, and then they come down and it goes away. That may happen a, a dozen or more times. 
you know, so they're convinced that it's a hallucination. It'll go away when they come down. Then one day it doesn't. And they're hearing those voices for the rest of their lives. And they're just as psychotic as any of the, any of the patients in a mental hospital. It doesn't, there's, that's it. They're done. The, the, the entity has moved in there. The prisoners used to call amphetamine the devil's drug. Yep. Mm, I yeah. believe it. So I finally found those stats. Yeah, it's always actually been labeled the devil's drug. It's for, now this is just for um, antipsychotic drugs and antidepressant drugs. Okay. The global antipsychotic sales have soared uh, to $14.54 billion in 2021 and estimated to soar to $15.5 billion in 2022. This is billion dollars of antipsychotic drugs. These are the drugs that rot out your brain. Yes. And they're giving them to kids now. That was the important part. Rot out your brain. Rot out your brain. He talks about your brain shrinking on these drugs. Uh, I, th I think it's, it's either 47 billion or 4.7 billion dollars a year selling any psychotic drugs. Billion. We're not talking million. We're talking billion. You know, and these are some of the most dangerous drugs on the planet. And they're dishing them out to kids. You know. Oh, that, that's perfect because that goes right into my next question that I wanted to ask you about. Have you, in over 35 years of working with uh, within the state prisons and mental hospitals or that. even outside, even these to kids? Yeah. Yep, that's exactly go. what they're doing. Okay. Amphetamines, Adderall, and Ritalin. When a kid is diagnosed with ADHD, they can't oh, yeah. sit still, they can't pay attention, they automatically put him on Adderall or Ritalin. And, and in your book, your uh, amazing uh, journey into the psychotic mind breaking. The spell of diary to okay. power. I can't plug it enough. Uh, I have to pause this a minute. We're going to skip back, but that is important to note here. Everyone, parents, everyone, Ritalin Adderall is putting your kids on legal methamphetamines. Think about that. Think about that. Or their brain. Or their brain is completely developed. You're putting your child on amphetamines. Basically, it's meth. Think about that. Whew, that's big. Okay, we're going to go back. Oh, God. They're just, just dishing them out by the, by the truckload because they're making a fortune on them. And kids don't matter. I mean... More than more than 7.2 million kids are on psychiatric drugs, and this was this was years ago. This this was uh, 2017. You know more now. So over 622,000 kids under the age of five are on psychiatric drugs. Over 80,000 are on ADHD drugs, which are amphetamines. Yeah. Have they given these to kids? Yep. Yep, that's um, exactly what they're doing. Amphetamines, Adderall, and Ritalin. When a kid is diagnosed with ADHD, they can't sit still, they can't pay attention, they automatically put him on Adderall or Ritalin. And in your book, your uh, amazing uh, journey into the psychotic mind, breaking the spell of the ivory tower, I can't plug it enough. Uh, please purchase the book. It's on Amazon. Uh, I'm going to definitely purchase the book. Anybody else interested should, but I'm definitely purchasing the book. And when I do, I might share a couple tidbits. We might do reading time with Krista. <laughs> I thought about doing that anyway, story time with Krista. But I want to tell my story. I want to tell my story from childhood on. Because that's what my book is about. So. Anyway. Plug my book too. Uh, you state that out of one out of every six people in the U.S. is on some sort of psychological 
medication, which that yep. was four or five years ago when this book came out. So it's got to be way more than that, which is yeah. already a staggering amount of people. Now, the the children that you worked with that had developed uh, paranoid schizophrenia, were they on any, uh, were they on Adderall? Were they on Ritalin? Were they already immersed in the, uh, the psychological medi medication game? Well, most of them, so I was working in the emergency room. Okay, so long-term chronic patients don't usually come there. They, they were usually first-time breaks where the parent brought them in and went, what's going on with my kid? He's acting bizarre. He's doing this stuff. You know, so, you know, it, it, it was, there wasn't any history that I knew of. I mean, it was a new break. Now that now, when they got out, they might put them on that. But if they're if they're psychotic, putting them on a amphetamine doesn't make any uh -huh. sense to me. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Yeah. I don't understand that either. Amphetamine is no good for a psychotic person. So they got uh, over thirty-eight thousand kids are on antidepressants. <coughs> over eighty-five thousand on antipsychotic drugs. These are the ones that rot out your brain. You know, over 389,000 are on anti-anxiety drugs. They're drugging the kids senseless. Wow. You know? Which is really making it difficult for common sense and uh, critical thinking to really uh, exactly. prevail. <laughs> right? Yeah, you're sitting in the classroom gorked out. You Thank know, you, the, the, oh, well, yeah, I'm feeling okay. You know, not yeah. thinking straight. Now, at what point, Jerry, did you start to realize that this was something other than just a mental disorder? You have a few uh, stories in your book, but uh, for the people that aren't aware of your book or haven't read it, what was that point where you were like, huh, this is, there's something more going on here. Was there an experience that you had with one of the patients in the prisons uh, that yeah. really just opened you up that you were like, there's something more to this that people are not realizing? Well, I, I started realizing that in the state hospital, but even then I didn't know what the voices were. I didn't want to believe that they were demons or, or spirits. I mean, I just, what I was thinking for decades was, well, this is just some faction of their subconscious mind that's kind of got berserk, you know. But then when I, uh, I started talking to the prisoners about what these voices were saying back to them, they were coherent conversations, you know, like you're talking to somebody over a telephone. They were speaking the same language. Patients would argue with them. They'd fight with them. They'd scream at them. They'd get annoyed by them. They'd cuss at them. Uh, and and I, I was privy to the conversation and even part of it a lot of the times, you know, where, where I got involved with the thing and the voices didn't like me very much at all. Um, so with these patterns, you know, the, some 23 patterns here, I got to wondering what would happen if I started throwing a monkey wrench into those patterns, you know. And uh, just out of curiosity, I started coming up with stuff to do that would trip up these patterns and was watching what they would do. So the, I always had a group of uh, 10 or 12 uh, inmates around me who were willing to tell me what the voices were telling them in real time. Okay, So I would tell them, okay, go home this week and try this. Come back next week and tell me what happened. Right. So it was that was constantly going on. And then as I was getting closer and closer to tripping them up and interfering with those patterns, these guys started coming back one at a time and saying, the voices don't like you. They don't like what you're doing. They don't like these exercises. They don't want me to come here. They want me to stay away from you. You know, they're giving me trouble the whole time walking over here. They didn't want me coming back here. So I found, well, that's interesting. A hallucination doesn't want the guy to, uh, you know, come back and, and, and look at what they are, you know. So... Here's, here's all these things that didn't make any sense. So eventually, one after another, they came back and they were all telling me, um, the voices don't like what you're doing. You know, they don't like these exercises. They don't want us taking part in that. They didn't want me coming here. And until virtually all of them were saying that. And went, well, that all right. So we got an experience. I don't want to mess up any more of his stuff. 
um, I think we're gonna roll down. So I'm like, I look up and he, that's when he gets up and he goes, I got to leave. And he shuffles out of the office. Yeah. Um, some saw the eyes, some didn't. If they saw the eyes, they were in worse shape than those who didn't see the eyes. But they were usually, they do have different um, some saw the eyes, some didn't. If they saw the eyes, they were in worse shape than those who didn't see the eyes. But they were usually either, uh, shadow people or black blobs um yeah there we go i couldn't find one and nobody would give me one yeah. so that, that was like you know the it was like okay you know the, this this is this could be dangerous right. dr hugh uh hugh wants to know um Okay, they're doing questions. And what we just actually stepped in on or seen the end of, a copy end of, was uh, he was answering. Uh, did your patient see someone uh, wanting to harm him, like stab him, because the voices were telling him to, them to, but they didn't do it because there wasn't anything available, I guess. I don't know. To find out the rest of this, go over to Raised by Giants and check it out. Tomorrow, I will post the last video because I want you all to hear uh, the his friend, the nurse, Lynn. I believe that's her name. I might be chopping her up too. Who knows? You know me. I have a headache real bad. Uh, anyways, I will show her testimony. It was awesome. It, it'll take you down. They both have books. Jerry definitely has a book. Uh, Ryder was plugging it all the way through. Good job, Ryder. You're so good. Shout out to Ryder. Any manifestations? Let me get out of this finish up my video <clears throat> i'd like to shout out to raised by giants Ryder lee shout out to jerry Marzins marzinski for putting your info out thank you so much for sharing your research this was for educational purposes only uh also i want to shout out to beth wrist this topic uh she is very interested in course i love my other channels penny press she loves this stuff too and uh she is great great with history check her out um of course jeebus crisp this issue he understands as well especially when it links into the rehabs and it does uh and so there you have it guys and Remember to be the reason someone believes in good people. Like, share, and subscribe, and have a great day. I'll see you on the next one.